Okay. Looks like we're, we're good. We're ready to go. Okay, so welcome to everyone. The Emanuel Adult Education Committee and Congregation of Israel. We're glad to sponsor this lecture by Herb Keenan. Um, before introducing him, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. Okay, so first the session is being, as Tammy said, the session is being recorded. Um, we've muted everyone, microphone and camera for the duration of Herb's presentation. At any time, you can enter a question into the chat room and we will ask, ask him your questions when we get to the Q&A at the end of the lecture. We'll unmute lines at that time also, so you may ask questions. We'll see how that goes. In the event of a Zoom bomber, um, please be patient with us as we remove him or her and we will quickly resume the program. So it's not gonna stop anything here. Okay, so now I'm pleased to introduce Herb Keenan. He's a senior contributing editor and analyst at the Jerusalem Post. He's originally from Denver, Colorado and has lived in Israel for around 37 years. He writes extensively on diplomacy, politics and Israeli society. And I just have to say as a little aside, I did read one of his other columns on Israeli society about grandparenting. <laughs> and I just right. love that this summer, like having them come to grandma and grandpa camp. It, right, right, right. <laughs> and, right. And it was right on, it was really good. Um, <laughs> he explores extensively, he writes extensively on politics and diplomacy. He's covered major stories that have shaped the nation. He lectures around the world. Um, he was here in person a few years ago, and we're very pleased to have him back for an encore lecture to discuss what the U.S. the 2020 elections mean for Israel and the impact um, of the new administration. Today, he is talking with us from Israel, and Herb, I'm now happy to turn the program over to you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time this Sunday afternoon uh, to spend with uh, with me a little bit. Look, I, I, the topic that is, is most timely right now, obviously, is the, the the elections, the 2020 elections, the Biden victory, and what does that mean? What does that bode for Israel, and what does that mean going forward for the Israeli-U.S. relationship? Look, as as Gail said, I, I've been in Israel for a long time. I've been in now for 37, 38 years. I've actually been at the Jerusalem Post for for 35 years. Uh, which is a lot of misspelled words. Uh, and when I first came to Israel, there were things, many things that I missed. Why did you come to Israel as a new Ola, as a new immigrant? You miss a lot. I missed, I missed my family. I missed Sundays. I missed the Denver Broncos. And every four years, I missed the U.S. elections, right? I missed the order of it all. I missed the certainty of the elections. Come what may, right? Every four years, America went to the polls on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November and elected a president. And with that exception one time in 2000 with, with Gore and Bush, on the first Wednesday after the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, America knew who the president was, right? And that was beautiful. And I missed that. I missed that because in Israel, it's completely different. In Israel, you go to the vote one day and in about two months time, if you're lucky, we figure out who the prime minister is. And I say, if you're lucky, because this time around, it's taken three elections and we're still not exactly sure who's in control, but not in America. In America, the electoral system worked, at least that used to be, that used to be the impression. I had what was called when I first came to this country, election envy, right? I envied the way it was done. And a lot of people here envied the way it was done. And anytime things seem to go tough as far as the political system here in Israel or it didn't work out or it slept a lot, a lot of people would say, you know what, if, if only we were America, it would all work out. By the way, the orderly way in which everything seemed to work in the States is opposed to how confused and how much everything here is very much a balagan often leads to a certain over idealization in Israel of America, right? Uh, over idealization of America in the eyes of many of many Israelis. 
whenever something untoward happens here, whenever something inconvenient happens here, whenever there's like an electric blackout or too many people standing in line in the supermarket, or there's a rude waiter in the restaurant, people have a tendency to say, oh, this would not happen in a, in a real country. It would not happen in a Medina Metukenet, in, in an orderly country. And the mother of all orderly countries for Israelis was, of course, America, right? Well, following this election, actually following the last election as well, that shine has kind of has kind of rubbed off. The elections last time, coupled with this round, has led many here to believe that you know what, our system might have quirks, it might have disadvantages, but so does the American system. That system also is not perfect for me, and I'm sure for many other Israelis. That romanticization, romanticization of the American political process, that election envy, uh, it's not, it's not exactly what it what it once was, and that's all I want to say is is kind of an introduction to the main topic, which is where do we go from her, here in the U.S. Israel relationship. But before I get into into President like Biden, and what he means for us in Israel, right? What he means for us in Israel, and that's the focus of the talk. Uh, a couple words about, about the guy who's leaving office about President Trump. First of all, there's, there's obviously a need to explain that had Israel been able to vote, and if Israel was the 51st American state with its population of 9 million people and its, its uh, geographic area, we would be like New Jersey, right? And we'd have like 14 electoral votes. If Israel could have cast its 14 electoral votes in this election, they would have gone for Trump in a landslide, in a landslide, right? Not in a landslide like Trump says, but in a real landslide. A poll just before the election had 63% of Israelis saying that they preferred Trump over Biden, and 18% saying that they, if they had their, you know, if they had the ability to do so, they would have voted for Biden. This obviously is in stark contrast to how American Jews, according to an AP and Pew exit poll, which I think is more trustworthy in this matter than the J Street or Republican Jewish coalition uh, uh, polls said that the Jews voted. I think AP said that 30% voted for Trump. Uh, I think Pew said that 28% voted for Trump. But again, that's, that's completely opposite of what the Israelis would have done had they voted. If one were a Martian, right, and one would, would, would land on earth, would look at the Jewish people, and he could say to himself, how can this be? How can this be, right? This is one people. Yet on this issue, a significant issue, how is it so completely different? Why are the views so completely different? And yes, we're one people, but obviously we have completely different concerns and completely different priorities. When American Jews go to vote, they're voting on a vast array of issues, obviously. They're voting on, on, on COVID, on the economy, on the Supreme Court, on abortion, on gay rights, on gun laws, Israelis. Even Israel, Israel, for American Jews, even if they support Israel, it's not necessarily at the top of the most important issues of what they're going to vote for the president about. It's not at the top of their list when deciding who to vote for president. For Israeli Jews, on the other hand, when asked who would they like to see as president, Israel is all that matters, right? Is he good for us? Has he made it more easier or more difficult for us in this region? and in the international arena. And on that, the question of Israel, right? Israelis have come to the conclusion that for us on this narrow issue, is he good for Israel? He's good for Israel. They're not asking Israelis when they look at who would they prefer to be president of the United States, they're not asking who is better for American Jews, right? They're asking who would be better for Israel. And, and on that, obviously the, the vast majority of Israel, of Israelis believe that Trump has been good. Now that doesn't mean that the Israelis have bought into, in, into the Trump package. Doesn't mean that they think the man is a mensch. Doesn't mean that they want him over, divide him over for dinner. But on the narrow issue of us, of Israel, right, most agree that he's been good, even very good. Now some may take issue with that and say that since he has weakened America's position in the world and Israel needs and wants a strong America, he hasn't been that great, right? You hear that argument. But again, if you base yourself on what the polling in Israel says about who Israelis would prefer, uh, most people, even with that taken as a factor, 
still believe that, that he's been good, even very good for us. And they have a de great deal of gratitude for what he's done. So what has he done, right? Where does this come from? Why do they like him? Why do Israelis like him for what he's done for Israel? There's a couple obvious things that he's done, right? First, he recognized Jerusalem and moved the embassy. He recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. He withdrew from the Iran deal. He laid down new parameters for a peace deal with the Palestinians, right? The deal of the century that he put down in January, reset the table, set new parameters. This included changing the starting point, right? That it was no longer a given that we're gonna to have to start by saying that Israel needs to return to the 1967 lines. He changed the narrative that Israel needs to completely withdraw the settlements, to uproot the settlements. And he challenged the orthodoxy that has taken, that has taken root so, so far in the international community that the main obstacle to peace is the settlements. And instead he said that the main obstacle to peace happens to be Palestinian terror. He brokered or helped broker peace deals with Bahrain, with the UAE, United Arab Emirates, with Sudan, and he gave us unstinting support in international forums, right? That's what he did for Israel, and those are big deals. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no disagreement, that there weren't disagreements with us, that we didn't disagree. We did. But when we disagreed, those disagreements were kept quiet. They were kept behind closed doors. What were those disagreements over? Disagreements were over, over China, right? Israel, Israel's relationship with China, they're over the Kurds, they're over, over the, uh, the U.S. were drawing from Syria and other, other parts of the Middle East. I mean, we didn't see eye to eye on all that, but that was very much kept outside of the, of the public arena. That's why Netanyahu and many others said something that the U.S. Jews who disliked Trump found so jarring, and that was that Trump was the best president for Israel in a long time, if not forever. Again, for Israel, for us. Which now brings me to Biden. What does it say about Biden? Let me just start off by saying that of the of the sixteen or the sixteen or so Democratic candidates who were on the uh, on the debate stage, when was it? In the summer of two thousand nineteen, from an Israeli point of view, the Biden Harris ticket was probably as good as it could get from among those candidates who were arrayed there. Right, Biden from the moderate wing of the party with a strong voting record on Israel, with a memory of the Holocaust and the Six Day War and Golda Meir, with a degree of emotional attachment to the country. It doesn't mean that he agrees with everything we do, especially with everything with, with, with everything that a Likud government does, but he's among those Democrats, right? The majority still of Democrats who still see Israel as the good guys, right? As the good guys. And apparently Harris also shares those views. Right? She also comes from the motto wing of her party though, you know, as district attorney in San Francisco, attorney general in, uh, in, in California, and just a couple of years in the Senate, her record on Israel is not as long and as pronounced as Biden was, but she's coming from the same place, we believe. A lot of people are worried that the Biden presidency, because Biden was Obama's vice president, will be similar to Obama's presidency on Israel. And as we all remember, those were not always the easiest of times. I don't think we're gonna go back to a repeat of the Obama presidency. I think if anything, what we'll see will be a reminiscence of the Bill Clinton days, right? Clinton was strongly pro-Israel. He had an emotional attachment to the country. I remember covering a speech he gave in the Knesset when he came here and he said that on his dying bed, his pastor told him that the one thing he better not do is sell Israel down the river, right? Um, Clinton passed the famous Kishka test of having a special place in his heart for Israel. He had a certain idea of how he thought the conflict should be solved but he liked us and Israelis got the sense that he liked us and they liked Clinton very much in return. The Obama administration came from a different perspective with many around the president, although not Biden, seeing Israel as kind of a colonial remnant and equated the Palestinian plight to that of the US blacks, the, 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 the African American population in America the worldview of many in the Biden administration was different. It was, was much, much more European, if you will, towards Israel. And as a result, it was much more difficult than, say, under the Clinton administration. I think Biden's worldview on Israel is closer to Clinton's worldview than, 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 than that of Obama. 
for the Obama administration, though, of course, a lot depends on who he surrounds himself with. How much will he be under the influence of the progressives inside the party? Looks like Herb may be frozen. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> we'll give him a minute. Looks like he's around. There he is. You. Hello? Got it. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're back yes you are <laughs> i'm sorry about that it happens uh just let me just reset this thing here so i can see what's going on uh, okay okay um what was i it was uh, the susan rice you got that part no I don't think so. No, where, where, where did I end up? So where did you stop hearing me? Um, Clinton's worldview? Yeah. Okay, look, again, I think Biden is going to be much closer to Clinton's worldview than, than, uh, than the, uh, Biden will be closer to Israel, to Clinton, than, than he will to the Obama administration, though a lot depends, obviously, on who he surrounds himself with, how much he will be under the influence of, uh, of the progressives. If he takes on Susan Rice as the Secretary of State, for instance, things could get a bit uncomfortable. If he takes Tony Blinken or Chris Coons or Tom O'Donnellan, uh, then the tone obviously is gonna, be, is gonna be a bit different and I think better for Israel. Uh, UN ambassador, I think we're gonna see a shift. Israel got complete total backing from the US, vocal backing at the, at the UN. I don't think we're going to see that. A couple of the names being mentioned are Wendy Sherman and Pete Buttigieg. Uh, Sherman's supportive, but she's not going to give us the same kind of backing, vocal backing, rhetorical backing, I think, that you would have from, uh, from somebody like Nikki Haley. Uh, Michelle Fornery at the, the, the defense is somebody Israel knows well and has dealt with very, very well and extensively in the past. Regarding the progressives, right? Everybody wonders about the progressives and how much impact they're going to have on, on Biden's policy. I think it's safe to say that Israel heaved a sigh of relief uh, that this last election was not a win for the progressives. The squad, the quote unquote squad, might have picked up a seat or two here and there, but they remain a distinct minority, which from our perspective is very good. Uh, I think it's far fetched to think that they're going to have. Uh, uh, that much of an impact or that they're going to drive Biden's foreign policy. So what's Biden going to do on Israel, right? What, what, what steps is he going to take? First of all, and unlike under uh, Obama, the Mideast, Israel will not be on the top of his list, right? This isn't going to be a, a top priority issue for, for Biden right now. Uh, the man has got a lot on his plate, COVID, the economy, racial tensions. The Middle East is, is far down on that list. Uh, I think it was very telling that in the final debate between Biden and Trump, Israel didn't even come up once, wasn't even mentioned. Now, this contrasts heavily with Obama, who made Israel and the Middle East a top, a top priority. I think that one or two days after his inauguration in 2008, January 22nd, he appointed George Mitchell is a special Mideast envoy. Um, it was a high priority for him. I don't think we're not there now. This is a different, a different, a different president and a different time. So what will he do? What will he do? First, I think it's easier to look at, at what he probably won't do. What he won't do is he won't move the embassy back to Tel Aviv. Right? The Jerusalem recognition is here to stay. Uh, he even made that clear during the campaign as a senator. He signed on to the bill to move the embassy. Uh, right now, I think that's pretty much a fail complete. By the same token, however, he's not going to push other countries to move the embassy, which is something that I think the Trump administration did try to do. 
not with resounding success, but they try to. But right now, the only other country with an embassy in Jerusalem is Guatemala. Malawi, a small African country, has just said it will move. But even that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, go, to the, go to the horses on that one. I'll wait to see. A number of other countries set up diplomatic offices in Jerusalem and were toying with the idea of opening up a full embassy. Uh, Ukraine, Honduras, Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic, uh, the, 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 the Czech Republic, Australia, Austria. But those now, I imagine, are off the table. Had Trump won, had Trump won, and countries were facing a prospect of four more years of Trump, I think that we would have seen more movements of countries' embassies to Jerusalem, if only to, to kind of curry favor with the Trump administration, recognizing that this is something that they wanted to see because they didn't want to be isolated. Um, so again, Biden's not going to move the embassy back, but he's not going to move, uh, he's not going to uh, pressure or, or get, try to get other countries to move to Jerusalem as well. I doubt sincerely that he's going to rescind recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, right? Right now, that's not a very contentious issue. Uh, I don't think he's going to want to be seen at this point in time as giving uh, Bashar Assad, uh, the Syrian president, any, any gifts. Um, so, so I don't think he's going to change that. The big issue, obviously, is Iran, right? What's he going to do with Iran? And this is where I think likely you are able or, 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 or possibly we are going to see some change. Biden has said, said a number of times that he wants to re-enter the, uh, the Iranian nuclear agreement, but perhaps renegotiate it. The question is what he's going to do if the Iranians say, well, let's, you can re-enter it, but we ain't changing it. You're going to have to come in under the old terms. What's he going to do then? Uh, it's not clear. Look, for Israel, Trump's withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal was a big deal. It's a big deal for two primary reasons. The first was because not only did it, it did it delay a nuclear march, but it took the nuclear march and threw it out the window. Israel's problem with the deal, or one of the major problems was the sunset clause that in 15 years, uh, the, all the bets are off and they can start to enrich uranium again. Um, that was one thing that Israel was problematic with it. The other was by withdrawing and applying tough sanctions on Iran, um, it limited Iran's ability to do the same degree of mischief in the neighborhood that they had been doing up until now, right? Trump's withdrawal and the sanctions hurt the Iranians. It's difficult to imagine that Biden will now come into power and want to undo all that and not realize that he's got some leverage by these sanctions that he can use. Uh, you know, the, the, the Trump sanctions put pressure on Iran and this pressure can be used to get more advantageous terms, such as doing away with the sunset clause, such as uh, uh, tying, uh, the, the, tying the, the, uh, their activities in the neighborhood to the deal, as well as their activities on developing ballistic, ballistic uh, missiles, making that contingent, bringing that into the agreement. Unfortunately, it wasn't in the agreement up until now. Um, the only thing is that he's also now going to come under a lot of pressure, even if he would want to leverage, use the, the sanctions to kind of leverage the Iranians, he's going to come under a lot of pressure from the Europeans who want the U.S. to swiftly go back into the deal. This is going to be a flashpoint with, with Israel, uh, with the Netanyahu government. And even, with the, even if, 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 if Gantz becomes prime minister, and I'll get to that in a minute, even with Gantz as well. Uh, but unlike last time under Obama, when Israel posed this alone, now, because of our relationships with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and our, our close relations with the Saudis, although we still don't have a formal agreement, it's more likely that we will not be the only one protesting, but that we're going to be speaking with them in one voice. If, uh, if, he goes, if he goes back to the agreement as it was, uh, Biden will face opposition not only from Netanyahu, as was the case in the past, but also from Israel and the Saudis and the UA and the Bahrainis, Israel and the Persian Gulf countries. And that's a different constellation. Right? Regarding Saudi Arabia, it's also interesting to watch what's going to happen with Saudi Arabia. Uh, Biden has said that he's not going to give them a human rights pass. If the Saudis feel that they're getting a cold shoulder from the US, paradoxically, what this might do was bring them closer to us, right? Because, because we both you know, feel that we're facing the same threat with the Iranians. 
Um, so, so it'll be interesting to see how he treats the Saudis, uh, because if he, if he, if he, if he kind of gives him a cold shoulder, this could, this could move up the timetable as to when possibly they, they might have ties with us. Another, another thing to watch about how he deals with the Saudis is if they get that cold shoulder, then the Saudis could actually move faster in trying to develop their own nuclear program, right? Feeling they no longer have this U.S. umbrella, they can't. They can't rely on the Americans anymore. And that just opens a whole completely different can of worms. Which brings me now to the Palestinian track. What's, what's the president-elect gonna do about the Palestinians? Look, from an Israeli point of view, the, the, the deal of the century that Trump put down last January was the best deal from our perspective put on the table over the last 50 years. Why? Because it changed the basic parameters. Gone was the talk of a need for a full Israeli withdrawal to, withdrawal to the 1967 lines. Gone was the idea that Israel had to remove uproot settlements. Gone was the idea that we're going to parcel out our security over the West Bank, even if there's some kind of state there to others, uh, or that we're going to, you're going to allow international monitors in the Jordan Valley. Uh, the parameters under the deal of the century changed fundamentally. Now, Biden is likely to to dismiss all that, to sweep that all off the table. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what he's gonna replace it with, but the idea of a Palestinian state, as was uh, the idea in, under the, the deal of the, the century, the idea of a Palestinian state on 70% of the territory with Israel retaining the settlements and, and security control of the entire area. Um, I think to a large degree, that idea now with the, uh, with the, with the election loss of Trump is pretty much off the table. Um, now that doesn't mean, however, right? I mean, Biden is not gonna move on that plan, but once a plan has the imprimatur of the US president and has been introduced, it's there, right? So, so if we go back to negotiations with the Palestinians, Israelis are gonna waive this thing, just as everybody waived the Clinton parameters, even after Clinton left office and, and they had no binding force they were still out there and they were still, for Israel, this will be the new starting point. And that could give us some kind of negotiation leeway if we, if we begin to negotiate again with the Palestinians. I think we should all brace ourselves for a return to arguments, arguments between Jerusalem and Washington over building and the settlements. I mean, Biden has been opposed to settlements for his entire political career. He comes from the school of thought that sees the settlements as, as the main obstacle to peace. We in Israel were accustomed over the last four years to complete radio silence on this matter, right? I imagine now that this radio silence is over. Also, the idea of a negotiated settlement to a two-state solution will once again now come back to the forefront, um, as opposed to like what we've had during the Trump years. And we saw this now with the, with the, uh, the peace deals with the Bahrainis and the UAE, the whole, the, the whole paradigm switched because under the Oslo paradigm and, and, and the paradigm, you know, pushed by Bush and then Clinton and, and, and Obama, the idea was first you negotiate a settlement with the Palestinians, right? First, get a deal with the Palestinians. And once you do that, that can radiate out and you'll have peace with the wider Arab world. What Trump did uh, it was he kind of reversed this. And instead of, you know, inward out, let's go outward in. We can't move with the Palestinians for a variety of reasons. So let's start to have relations between Israel and the Arab countries who want those relations because they have common interests. And maybe once you have that, that will supply some kind of pressure or apply pressure on the Palestinians, forcing them to be a more, bit more compromising than they have in the past. So it's a completely different paradigm. I'm afraid now that we might go back to the other way. Again, this idea that, that you know, just negotiate already a deal with the Palestinians and let's have two states. And while that might sound fine on the face of it, the problem is it hasn't worked for a quarter of a century. And there's little reason looking right now at the actors in the region and the, and, 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 and the lay of the land to think that that's gonna work anymore now, even if you have, even if you have a new president. Um, the peace deals, right? The peace deals that we signed or, or the agreements we signed with the UAE and with Bahrain uh, and, and to a lesser degree with Sudan, 
amid talk of other deals in the pipeline with the Saudis, with Moroccans, with Oman, this has fundamentally changed the map in the Middle East. I think this is something important, right? Trump fundamentally reset the Middle East table. He reset the table. He cleared away the old dishes and he replaced them with new dishes, with new settings. And Biden, when he comes into office, he's gonna to have to ask himself from the get-go, uh, at least once he approaches the Middle East, whether he will toss the Trump dishes aside just because they're Trump dishes, just because Trump set that table, or he will see the advantages in this newly set table and work with it. Um, the Middle East at this point can essentially be divided into to three or four camps vying for hegemony, right? vying for control. I say three or four because ISIS is one of those camps has largely been sidelined, thank God, although they're not knocked out of the ring, but they've been sidelined. Uh, the other camps vying for control, Iran, Turkey, and the camp of stability, right? The camp of stability, which includes us, Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and now the Persian Gulf countries, the, the so-called moderate Sunni states. What the camp of stability did in the waning days of the Trump presidency, and you have to ask yourself why these agreements took place in the last month before the election. What they did was band together to be able to confront Iran and a lesser degree Turkey, which is also a threat to all those countries, before a new administration is installed in Washington that may reverse field, may reverse the current regional policy. The camp of stability melded then, right before the elections, so that even if an administration would come into power that wanted to reverse Washington's policies towards Iran, right, wanted to take a softer approach towards Iran, this new alliance would be able to stand firm together in opposition to the Iranians, right? And it's not only against Iran, like I said, Egypt, the UAE, the Saudis are equally concerned about Turkish designs in the region. I think the Turks are going to have a tougher time under Biden, by the way, than they had under, true, uh, under Trump. The agreements we made, we signed with the UAE and Bahrain and with Sudan, uh, which is very much dependent financially on the UAE and the Saudis, realigns the Middle Eastern map fundamentally. And any Biden policies here are going to obviously have to take that into consideration. The Middle East that Biden is going to come front, confront in, two, in 2021 is far different from the one that he left in 2016. Uh, now, Trump's critics say that in his four years in office, he made adversaries of allies, particularly in Europe, and allies of adversaries, such as Russia. One region where this wasn't true was the Middle East, where he actually strengthened America's traditional allies in the region, Israel, Egypt, the Persian Gulf countries, and got them to bind closer together. And this now is something that is going to have to be taken into consideration by any US administration. The map here is now drawn fundamentally different than it was four years ago. And Biden will obviously have to take that in consideration when he is when he is weighing his possible next moves. It's also, I mentioned watching Biden's policy to Saudi Arabia. It's also worth something that Israel is gonna be watching carefully is his policies towards Egypt, right? There's been a lot of criticism uh, towards Egypt. Um, Sisi, although he might not be a Jeffersonian Democrat, right? For us, right, he's a godsend. For us, you know, the, having him in power in Egypt instead of the Islamists is extremely important. If Biden takes actions that will somehow weaken him, then this is something that Israel is going to be very concerned about, and this could be a, a bone of contention. And finally, we get to an area of tone. Uh, one area I think I mentioned earlier, but I think we're also going to see some change here. Israel under Trump received unstinting backing from, from, from the U.S. and international arenas, the international fora and in the international arena. Plus, there, were, there was never condemnations of, of building and settlements. There was never condemnations of, of Israeli military action in Gaza, right? The, the whole uh, jargon of, you know, disproportionate uh, reactions. We didn't hear that over the last four years. Uh, Israel backed us to the hilt. And that was very important because it set the tone. If the U.S. publicly blasts Israel, as it did under the administration, under the Obama administration, then others who are dying to do so, right, will, will jump at the opportunity. But if they don't get a back win from the U.S. in doing that, then they're going to be more reticent to do so. 
in the last two years, right, we haven't seen the same degree of condemnations of Israeli policies coming from the EU than we did beforehand. That's not a coincidence. It's because they didn't get the cues for that coming from, coming from the US. Is that going to change now? Look, I, I hope not. I mean, Tony Blinken, uh, uh, Biden's close aide, said that, that, that Biden, during the campaign, he said Biden is not going to wait, want to make disagreements with Israel public. Uh, Obama did as a point of principle, because he wanted to show that there was daylight. That's, you know, that, that famous quote. Um, I don't think Biden is going to go there, which, uh, which hopefully will, will, will allow us to deal with the disagreement up a little easier than under the, under the Obama administration. Now, how does this affect Israeli politics, right? Because, you know, this all affects Israeli politics. What impact will the Biden victory have on, 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 on Israeli elections? There's an old saying here that when America sneezes, Israel catches a cold. That's to say that what happens in the US political arena deeply impacts on Israel. So in that spirit, how will the elections affect our own very fraught political situation? And our political situation is indeed a very difficult and very fraught. As you know, we've had three elections since April 2019. Uh, finally, we set up an emergency corona government, which just is schlepping along. It's not doing that well. It's a rotation government. It's supposed to, Bibi is supposed to hand over the, the keys to the office to Benny Gantz next November. Hardly anybody in the land thinks that that's really going to happen. Uh, there's been intense speculation that the government will fall over a failure to pass the budget either in December or next March. Um, and we're going to go to new elections yet again. We're going to go to, to the, fourth, new, uh, the fourth election in two years. That being the case, how will Biden being in the White House impact on voting patterns here? Uh, there are those who will say that Benny Gantz, the blue and white head, should initiate the elections now because the loss of Trump hurts Bibi, right? The loss of Trump hurts uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And Netanyahu campaigned successfully in the past on his strong relations with Trump, saying that he's in a league of his own with his relationships with the leaders of the world, Trump, Putin, Modi in India, and that this is a valuable asset for Israel, that, that the Trump relationship is something that Israel doesn't want to lose. That his relationship with Trump is something is so valuable strategically that Israel doesn't want to lose it by voting him, Netanyahu, out of office. Also remember that Trump provided Netanyahu with some election gifts prior to the last couple of elections. Uh, the Golan sovereignty recognition came prior to the first election last year. The deal of the century came prior to the, the, uh, the, the election in March of this year. Um, those types of gifts, one can assume, will not be in the offing with Joe Biden in, in, in the White House. So, so this school of thought says that if Gantz initiates an election now, right, the loss of Trump is going to hurt Bibi. That makes sense to a certain degree, but you can argue the opposite as well. But there's a strong counter argument, and that is if there will be, as everybody expects, confrontations with the U.S. over Iran and the settlements, Israelis will want someone in office who can stand up to the U.S. president. And Netanyahu, whatever you may think of the man, right, he's shown that he's willing to do that. Personally, I think this government is going to fall either within the next few months or we're going to go to elections by probably April, May of next year. And in that case of new elections, I think old paradigms whereby Israelis vote on security and defense issues probably are not going to hold to the same degree as they have in the past. And there's going to be new issues that are going to be at the forefront this time. And that is Corona and the economic hardships that we've had because of Corona. Right? And on those issues, Neither Bibi nor Gantz is a sterling record, right? Some other party may come out, some other party or some other personality may come out of nowhere right now and be the real surprise in the next election because the elections will not be on the traditional security, diplomatic, political issues, right? But rather on ec economics and the pandemic. What the US elections I think have proven to those sitting in Jerusalem is the Corona, the COVID, can bring down and does bring down governments. Now, believe me, they're internalizing that message in Jerusalem. Israel's handling of the pandemic has been spotty. It's been spotty, right? The first wave, we did very well. 
We didn't so do so well with the second wave. Now we're coming out of a lockdown. The, the numbers are, 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 are doing better, right? We're doing better than many others in the world, but we could have done a lot better had we learned the lessons early. Um, but it's taken a huge toll on the economy and on the solidarity inside the country. And as a result, Netanyahu probably would rather not go to elections right now because what leader wants to go to elections when you have 20% unemployment? But he also doesn't want to turn over the keys of the government to uh, Gantz next November. So I think that we're, we're going to go to elections. But just as American Jews do not pick and who they're going to vote because of Israel, so too Israeli Jews, I don't think, are going to decide on whether to vote for Gantz and Biden, dependent on who can have a, a, a better relationship with the, with the U.S. president. And this will not be the main factor in their decision making. It will be one of the factors, but it's not going to not going to be the main one. Like I said, the main one for the first time, maybe even ever, will be economy and health issues. Which just brings me now to just a couple of final comments I, I'd like to make before open up for questions. And that is, look, I mean, you know as, as well as I do, you feel it as well as I, as much as I do, that Corona is kind of spread an ill will through an, an ill wind through much of the world, a feeling kind of that everything is breaking down. And that ill wind has affected us over here as well. You feel it in the inability of this government, this, this, this uh, unity government, inability to kind of get together to effectively fight the pandemic. You see it in the angry protests that are happening on the streets every Saturday night against Netanyahu. You see it in the, in the angry discourse with the, with the ultra-Orthodox, with the Haredim. There's a certain feeling that things are just not clicking, right? They're not working like they should. Things are kind of falling apart. The election of Biden, I think, has added uh, here a sense of impending difficulty with the U.S., also adding to the sense of the things are things are kind of out of out of whack right now to a certain degree. That sense of an impending collusion with the collision with the new administration, by the way, our sense that there's likely to be a collision with Biden came out very much very quickly after the the election when everybody here was sitting there with a stopwatch, wondering how how long it would take for Bibi to call Biden. Right? He didn't do. He wasn't one of the first leaders to do it. It took him 12 hours and 13 hours. And that was a big issue. And over here, where we like to kind of, you know, say gavalt over everything that was, oh my God, look, this is, this is where it's going. Personally, I'm not overly worried about, about the, the Biden administration. I think the tone, like I said, is going to be different. It's not going to be like it was over the last four years, but we're not facing a cop of apocalypse either. Now, we need Israelis, we need some confidence. Our relations with the U.S., thank God, after 72 years is strong and wide and deep. I think if the eight years of the Obama administration taught us anything here, it's that the Israeli-U.S. relationship can withstand some rocky patches and persevere and persevere pretty well. It was tough at the top, right? B.B. Obama had a tough relationship, but it was more than compensated by strong defense intelligence ties by business ties, by strong public support, by supporting Congress. Um, personally, I don't think that the relationship between Bibi uh, and Biden is going to be anything near what it will be between what it was between Bibi and Obama. Plus, who knows? I mean, Bibi, Bibi's been prime minister now for uh, 14 and a half years. He's not going to be there forever, right? Uh, likely that within the four years of Biden's term, we're, we're likely to have a new prime minister here as well. Um, as a people, right, Israelis and, and, and as Jews, I think that we have a default mode and that default mode is to fret, to fret, right? We fret, therefore we are. And I think there's, there's what to fret about. I'm not downplaying that, but there are also something happen, some things happening on the ground right now, right between our eyes that we would not have imagined five years ago, good things, positive trends that's worth keeping in, in mind, even as we're cognizant of all the problems being caused by Corona and Israel's fractured political moment and the potential problems with the, with, with the, with the, with the US administration. But at a strategic level, Israel is doing pretty good. Right? We just signed agreements with three Arab countries and more are apparently on the way, giving us a degree of acceptance we have never known in this country. Terrorism right now is at its lowest level, thank God, since 1962. 
Hezbollah is the weakest it's been in decades. Our military situation in the region has rarely been better, nor has our diplomatic position ever been better in the world, right? S&P last week gave, uh, affirmed Israel's double A credit rating. Um, our G GNP or G GDP is, is, is the, it shrunk the second lowest of any developed country in the world, right? It shrunk as a result of the corona by 1.4%. The US shrunk by 2.9%. Germany shrunk by 4.2%. So not everything stinks, right? Not everything is rancid. And that's something that here in Israel, when you're tied to the news and it's, it's the news always seems bad, I think that's, that's, that's very important to keep in mind. Things are happening here that, that we couldn't have imagined, like I said, just just a few months ago. I think one of those things that struck me, I think about a month and a half ago, was the, uh, the foreign minister of the United Arab Emirates uh, went to Berlin to meet Gabi Ashkenazi, our foreign minister. And they went to the Holocaust Memorial. And in the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, the UAE ambassador who signed, in, in signed the, 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 uh, the guest book in Arabic saying never again, right? Never again in Arabic. And when you think about that, that's, that's an incredible moment. Because up until now, right, Holocaust denial has been widespread in the Arab world, right? They've either denied the Holocaust or downplayed the Holocaust because this was part of the argument about the illegitimacy of Israel. The whole argument, an Arab argument you often heard was that, you know, Israel's only there because of the Holocaust. That the, 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 the Europeans are are, 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 are paying for their own sins by setting up Israel in the Middle East. So if you deny the Holocaust, then there's no reason at all for Israel to be there. Here you had the foreign minister of a important, wealthy Arab state going to Germany, writing never again in Arabic in the guest book. That's, that's, a, that's a sign of changing times. And it's something that I think we as Israelis and as Jews should keep in mind, right? It shows how things are changing. And that the trend lines, the trend lines, despite everything that we hear about and read, they're not, they're not only negative. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll just open it up for anything, any questions you might have on that or anything else I didn't, that I didn't cover. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Look, and, and you gave us both sides, which I really appreciate because it's so easy to get stuck, as you said, in the negative. Um, let's see. Are there, are there people who want to ask questions in the chat? We do have a question in the chat. Do you want me to read it? Sure. All right. After I've read this question and, and Herb has answered, I am going to unmute everybody. So you will have an opportunity to please raise your hand if you want to be called upon to ask a question so we can just keep some um, sense of normalcy here. So um, Herb, the question that we have is how can Israeli Jews look at our incidents of white supremacy, prolifer proliferation of swastikas and neo-Nazi marchers shouting Jews will not replace us and the president of the United States not making pointed remarks against that behavior? Well. Wow. Look again. It, it, it goes. It, it goes to what I, I. I think it goes to what I said in the beginning. And that we we live in different. We live in different worlds, right? Um, and we don't always see the interests uh, of the others. Um, I, I think Israelis see that, and it, it's. A, uh, I don't think. I don't think they, they recognize perhaps as much as they should what that does to American Jews. Um, I think you have a situation where, where both American Jews and Israeli Jews, where they're, they're so involved in their own problems and their own in their own lives, and they, they see their own interests that they're not necessarily in tune to the other. Um, I think that's an example of that, right? I think I think when, when Israelis look at that, they kind of weigh that. Okay, that's that's bad and that's that's harmful. But look at all that he's done for us. And that kind of, on that balance, it kind of tips the balance in, in Israel's favor. Uh, and on the other hand, I think a lot of Israeli Jews looked at American Jews supporting uh, Obama and the Iranian deal against the, you know, the vast majority of what, what Israelis, uh, the, Israeli, uh, the Israeli political system or the Israeli population wanted, people saw it as an existential threat. And they, all, they, all, they wondered too, you know, how could the American Jews do that? Uh, but again, I think it's just, it's, it's you know, 
we, we live in different realities and uh, we, 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 we base our positions on where we sit and where we sit, what touches us, what affects us personally is the most important. Thank you. Um, I am now going to unmute everybody. You should be able to unmute yourselves now. Again, please, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand if you wanted to ask or a question. And if you can keep yourself muted, if you're not asking a question, that would be great too. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Background noise or is that someone asking a question? White right. They don't use white right. yourself if you're not asking a question. Thank you. Yourself. At the bottom. Way at the bottom. All right, go ahead. Michael. Hi, Michael. Michael, you had a question? Michael Kamens? Yes, I do. Um, and it has to do with how do we deal oh. with the boycott of Israeli uh, West Bank products. That seems to be a, a big issue uh, growing worldwide. Look, it was interesting that, uh, you know, Mike Papaya was just in Israel yeah. and he said that uh, th th no longer will the U.S. say made in the West Bank uh, items that are made in the settlements. Uh, that's, I mean, from an Israeli point of view, that, that's, that's significant. Uh, the, oh, Europe the Europeans actually have on, you know, on record that uh, the, the, the different countries are supposed to label, uh, label, the label any goods made in, in uh, beyond the Green Line in, East, in Jerusalem, oh. uh, East Jerusalem, or Jerusalem over the Green Line, the Golan Heights, you have to label those as made, made in the West, made in occupied territory. Um, I think Papeo's gesture was nice. Uh, I think it was kind of disappointing that it happened so late in the game. It would be nice if it happened uh, three years ago and it would have, it would have had time to, to kind of germinate down and really be, you know, a firm policy. Uh, some people say, well, what, you know, these, these parting gifts that Papeo gave Israel during his recent visit here, that being one of them, what are they worth? Well, if it becomes a statute in the State Department, if they're gonna, if, if they're gonna formalize it, then if they reverse it, there's a certain political cost for it, right? If, if the US now, if the Biden administration says, we're gonna walk this back, then Israel can say, okay, well, what are we gonna, you know, what are we gonna get as compensation for it? So, so I don't think it's, it's completely, uh, it's completely, completely, you know, useless. I think that there is some use in, in the administration doing these things, even as it's, uh, even as it's on its way out the door. Um, look, as far as the question about, about, about BDS, about the boycott of Israel, I mean, the biggest slam to BDS is the, you know, the, the, the peace agreements between uh, the Bahrain and, and the United Arab Emirates, right? I mean, you've got, you've got Persian Gulf countries who are saying, we want Israel, we want to have relations with Israel because we want Israeli investments and Israeli technology, Israeli goods, uh, and some guy in Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> Say I'm not going to deal with the with Israel because you know because of that. Uh, you know that's kind of the uh, being a little more Catholic than the Pope. So I think I think those agreements actually are taking a lot of the wind out of the BDS sails. Great, thank you, Herb. We also have another question in the chat. Could Pakistan recognize Israel? And also, what about the correct corruption charges against Bibi? <laughs> Uh, that's that's a small small topic. That, that last topic. Um, look, as, as far as Pakistan, Pakistan is dependent to a large degree on Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, I think, would like to see as many countries uh, uh, formalize ties with Israel as possible, so that when they do it, uh, you know, they won't they won't be isolated. Um, so I think they're pressuring Pakistan to do it. Um, but you want the country to do it because they want to do it. Right. 
And this is something that I think is fascinating with United Arab Emirates. The, the, the peace agreement with the United Arab Emirates right now is a completely different beast from anything that we're used to. Right? We're used to a cold peace with Jordan and Egypt, a peace between the governments and the security apparatus, a peace that never trickled down to the people. And here with the United Arab Emirates, you've got a peace that looks, looks very warm, right? You've got, you know, all, you've got direct flights already underway. You've got, uh, you've got a, 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 an order put out by the UAE to the major hotels in, in, in Abu Dhabi, uh, in Dubai, saying that they have to have kosher food. I mean, this is, this is trickling down to the masses. It's, it's a completely different thing. Um, is there something interesting? I wrote an article about this. The United Arab Emirates has a happiness minister, right? A happiness minister. We have an agricultural minister. We have a construction minister, an absorber. They have a happiness minister. And I don't think it's coincidental, right? That the, 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 the first Persian Gulf country that, that wanted to have ties with Israel had a happiness minister. And what's the job or the role of the happiness minister? The role is to factor into policy decisions what is good for the people, what is for the goodwill of the people. And the fact that, that they have that kind of minister, it's, 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 it's logical, right? If you have a happiness minister and you care about what's good for your people, then you can have relations with Israel because that can help your people. Helps our people, helps their people, right? Halavai, were that the Palestinians would have, you know, would have a happiness minister. That then we'd be on a completely different, a different track. My fear with Pakistan is that if you if if you push them into it, not because they want to do it, but because they're being forced to do it, then eh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm I'm not sure what it's worth. Uh, they've got to want to do it, and, and it's got to come, it's got to come from them. It comes from outside. It could be a bit, a bit more, a bit more problematic. Again, it would be wonderful for them to, you know, be good. Israel would like to have ties with, uh, with, with all these countries. It's, you know, it helps you. It's, uh, it's beneficial, you know, in many different ways. Um, but if you could get the people to, to, to grab onto it, like you see in the UAE, uh, then it's a completely different, a completely different model. Um, as far as, as far as Bibi, and the corruption, uh, the corruption charges. Look, he's going back to trial. This thing has been schlepping along for, you know, for, for years now, for, for three or four years. You know, it used to be that in Israel, you know, you, you kind of divide the country into the right and the left. And the, 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 the general parameters for that was, you know, pro-settlement, anti-settlement, you know, what do you want to do with the, with the, with the West Bank, with the, the Yadav uh, That was what was the dividing line between the country. Country right now is not that divided on those issues anymore because there's no real diplomatic process. It's divided on one issue, right? Divided, and this is what we went to the elections over the last three election cycles. One issue, and that's Bibi Netanyahu. Is he a saint or is he a scoundrel, right? And half the country thinks he's a saint and half the country thinks he's a scoundrel. And that's where we're at right now. Um, Bibi, I mean, if, if you just look at it, if you take a cold look at him, um, he's a remarkable politician, right? Because like I said, this is a guy who's reigned in Israel for 14 and a half years. 20% of Israel's history, he has been the prime minister, right? Think about that for a minute. 20% he's been the prime minister. If you put that in American terms, that's President Trump for 45 years, right? <laughs> it, it, that's, I mean, what makes that even more remarkable is the fact that he's retained being the prime minister, even though the man is not beloved of the nation, right? People never connected viscerally to Netanyahu to the degree they did to like a, a Menachem Begin, right? He was seen kind of as aloof, wealthy outsider, uh, American, right? Um, they didn't connect to him. They can't stand his wife. They hate his kid. He's got these three corruption charges over his head, yet he wins time and time and time again. And you got to ask yourself, why? Why? What, what's going on? What is it about him? And my personal opinion, this is a, you know, a thesis that I've been pushing for a long time, it has to do with security. It has to do with the fact that right now, in 2021, there's been two people killed by terrorist actions. Right? Um, you go back 20 years ago, September, we marked 20 years for the Second Intifada. The Second Intifada was a watershed moment in Israeli history. It changed Israel. 
the, 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 the four and a half year terror war that killed 1,053 Israelis, more people were killed in that war in, in the Intifada than the Six Day War, the Second Lebanon War, the, 50, the 56 Suez Campaign, right? Um, that changed the nation fundamentally. And what Bibi has done in his 10 years of office right now, he's given the people security. He's given the people security. And the numbers bear that out, right? In the 10 years, from 2009 to 2019, when he's the prime minister, an average of 14 Israelis have been killed by terrorism a year, 14. In the nine years beforehand, an average of 130 Israelis were killed by terrorism, right? And that terrorism affected everybody. So, so it's the security component, the, the sense that if he's there, you have better security. I think that's the reason for his longevity, despite, despite everything despite the corruption and despite the, his lack of popularity and his wife and his kids and the whole mess, right? What I think is happening now though, is COVID is kind of changing things because now the concern is, you know, people are thinking less security and more economic security, financial security. And then COVID, he hasn't, he hasn't you know, he hasn't done that well, uh, or people say he hasn't done it, or the impression is that he's not, not in complete control of the situation. Uh, so, so here, if he goes to election now, uh, is the security thing still going to be foremost in people's mind as it has been up until now? I'm not so sure. Also, I mean, 14, there's also you know, there's a certain degree of BB fatigue that even people who who like him and think that he's done you know tremendous things for the country, uh, certain things for the country, even those people are you know they kind of just you know sick of it already. All all the noise and all the negativity and just you know where there's smoke there must be fire. So there's a certain fatigue. But he's still if you look at the polls right now. Right? If we would have elections today, he would come up on top. Wouldn't necessarily have an easy job forming the coalition again, but he would still come up on top. Herbert Hoffman, you'd like to ask a question? What, what is your view about the weakening Jewish unity in Israel and in the US? There are deepening divisions between religious and secular in Israel. In the U.S., we have uh, Jewish youth becoming more uh, left-wing and militant and, and ignoring Jewish identity. Look, I, 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 I'm not a... Uh... I'm not an uh, I'm not an apocalyptic guy on, 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 on many things, including this, right? Um, uh, you know, people talk about the, you know, the, the growing rift between Israeli and the diaspora Jews. Um, Seder, yeah, right, I mean, I hear that. I hear that. I, I hear people say, you know, that the millennials are turned off by Israel because of Israeli policies, right? Israeli just, if Israel just wouldn't build in the, in the settlements or if Netanyahu wasn't the prime minister, then, you know, maybe Israel could connect better with the millennial youth in America. I'm not so sure I buy that. I'm not so sure that it's it's policy driven. I think that you know if I look at the if I look at the rift between Israel and, and, and American youth, um, I think it has to do more with 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 Jewish identity among American youth than with with any kind of uh, of uh, their displeasure with Israeli policy. Because if you feel connected to Judaism, right? If you cannot feel connected to your Jewish identity, you're going to feel a connection to Israel. Right. And with that connection to Israel, you're going to be connected even if the country takes certain policies that you don't like. However, if you have no connection to Yiddishkeit, if you have no connection to Jewish identity, you don't know your own history, right? then what is Israel to you? Why is Israel any different than Poland or Scotland right? or Venezuela? It's so I think, I think the problem with, 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 with our <laughs> relations with the American Jewish youth is a problem more for the American Jewish community, uh, I humbly submit, than, than Israel. I think, I think the American Jewish community has to deal with the problem in getting their youth to be identified uh, as Jews. As far as the Israeli component of that, look, like I said, it, Israelis see things, and, and I'm not justifying this, this is just the way it is. It, we're self-centered, right? We see things through our own prism. And I, I would hope that Israelis would be able to, you know, to, to kind of take a wider view of, of, uh, of Jewish peoplehood uh, as well. And also take into consideration, you know, the, 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 the aspirations and the, the points of view of Jewish communities abroad and, and, and realize that they're valid and that they, they need to be taken into consideration. Uh, you don't have enough of that here as well. So you don't have enough Jewish identity on one side in America 
and you don't have enough, I think, uh, you know, consideration for the importance of, of, of the Jewish communities abroad in Israel. And that creates a situation. That being said, we've never had, it's never been great, right? I mean, it's not like it, like 50, 30 years ago, and there was such a great connection. Uh, I mean, it, 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 with the older generations, then, you know, there was a connection, but, uh, but you, you always had certain problems. You don't have certain problems. As far as the, the problems between, uh, you know, uh, secular and Haredi Jews in Israel, that problem has been exacerbated a great deal by, by the COVID, by the, by the coronavirus to a large extent because large portions or significant portions of the Haredi population just haven't heeded the regulations of the government. Uh, and it's unfortunate because we were going in the right direction. There's been a greater over the last 10, 15 years because of economics, there's been a greater integration of the Haredi into the workforce, bringing them more, into, they being more integrated into Israeli society. They feel more a part of Israeli society. Israelis, Israelis see them more a part of Israeli society. And then you get COVID and you see that some, some rabbis are saying, you know, that you can disregard what the government is telling you about the regulations and that's sending everything backwards. And that's unfortunate, it's something that Israel is gonna to have to spend uh, some energy and time over the next few years, I think, trying to rebuild again. And thank you, Herb. We do have a two-part question in the chat. Um, it, what percentage of Israelis believe in a two-state solution, as well as do Israelis understand that his Israeli support is all based on keeping evangelical vote? Right. Look, as far as uh, the two-state solution, like I said, the, the, the second intifada had a huge impact on, on, on Israeli society. A huge impact because everybody felt the terrorism, and and and, and the second Defada was seared into the consciousness because it happened two months after Camp David. Remember Camp David in the in July two thousand. Yasser Arafat goes to Camp David, meets Ehud Barak and, and and Bill Clinton, and you have a left wing prime minister who is willing to give Arafat ninety five percent of the West Bank and half of Jerusalem. And what's Arafat's answer? The second intifada. And that moment, that answer, I think, is, 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 is it, it, it disabused Israelis of the idea that this uh, two-state solution is viable. Not that they're opposed, but that it's viable. That it's, 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 it's ever, because if, if, if Arafat was unwilling to accept that, then they're not gonna be willing to accept anything. So I, and so I think the, you know, the whole, I, I think it's, it's a nice notion. I think people still have it as a notion, but it's not anything that people really think is viable right now. And just to give you an indication of that, um, 1992 elections, Yitzhak Rabin beats Yitzhak Shamir and the two left-wing Zionist parties, Merits and Labor, win 56 seats out of the 120-seat Knesset. Right, 56, that's huge. The last elections, a couple months ago, those two parties won seven seats, right? That says something. That says something about what happened to the left. It says something what happened to the belief that somehow you're gonna be able to negotiate a, you know, a two-state solution right now. I think, again, I think some people would like to see it, but they don't believe it's gonna happen. And again, beyond the second intifada, there was another traumatic thing five years later, and that was the disengagement from Gaza. Is what was disengaged from Gaza? Israel did something that was incredibly traumatic. It uprooted 10,000 people from their homes, right? So, you know, that's a big thing. 10,000 people were uprooted from the homes with the hope that something would happen positive. What happened? You uprooted the people from the home. Did it bring a two state solution? Did it bring peace? Did it bring conciliation? No, it brought the worst situation for the South we've ever had with tens of thousands of rockets falling. So that, those realities, right, have an impact on people. You just don't forget them. And I think this is something that the Obama administration did not fully take into account. I think they didn't take into account the trauma that those two events had on Israeli society. And they thought that they can just go back to these old formulas that were drawn up in the 1990s in a completely different reality. And I think that if the Biden administration takes that same point of view, thinking that, nothing has changed and you can just go back to what you proposed a quarter of a century ago, it's not gonna work because things have changed, reality has changed and reality has impact on people's consciousness in this country. Uh, the second part of the question had to do with evangelicals. 
uh, to what degree do the Israelis, yeah, you know, but this goes again to what I said earlier about how we live in different, uh, different realities. American Jews look at, the, look at the evangelicals and there's a certain fear, there's a certain fear factor, right? They don't wanna be missionized, they don't want church and state, uh, they don't wanna hear Jesus talk, they don't wanna hear God talk in the public square. Israelis look at the evangelicals, they see people who are, who are extremely politically supportive of them and, uh, and, and the West Bank, and they say, more power to them, right? Well, this is great, we want the support, we need the support. And then they hear that they got, you know, left-wing Jews are, 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 are divorcing themselves from Israel, and they see the evangelicals uh, coming, you know, supporting Israel, and they don't see anything negative in it. So again, because of our different realities and how we look at things differently, the way Israeli Jews look at the evangelicals and the way American Jews look at the evangelicals, I think is, is fundamentally very different. I remember Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin was the guy uh, in the, in the 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19 when he really started to push the evangelical relationship. And I remember he said something, he said something no, that always, it was no. always very telling. He goes, look, evangelicals, you know, there's a concern, what do they want? They want to, they, they, they want to bring the Mashiach. He said, you know what? I'll worry about the identity of the Mashiach when the Mashiach comes, right? In the meantime, I need their support. I need their friendship and I'm going to take it. And as a people who we don't have the luxury necessarily to only pick, you know, those the, you know, the, the, the liberal Christian Protestants with the great morals, and we don't have the luxury to necessarily pick our friends like that. Their support is, is important for us. Bob, Bob, you had a question. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hi, Herb. Uh, great talk. Uh, let's switch to the Palestinians. Arakat died. Abbas is about to die. What's the future there? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. That's a good question. Look, um, nobody knows. Nobody knows. No, uh, Abbas is 84. Um, and nobody knows. He hasn't appointed a successor. He's afraid to appoint a successor. There's concern, you know, that, that you know, he dies. All hell is going to break out between between Fatah and Hamas, Hamas will try to take control. Um, one of the reasons, it was interesting that when, 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 when the Israel first signed the accord with the UAE, uh, the Palestinians went crazy, right? They withdrew their ambassador, they, 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 they burned the, the, the flag, the UAE flag. Um, they were worried, or Abbas was worried apparently that the UAE was trying to get the uh, Tahlan the guy who used to be in, the, in Gaza, a uh, leader at one time, he fell out with Abbas, he moved to, he moved to uh, Dubai, and he was trying to get him back into power, and this, was, this is a way to do it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the leadership there. Um, I think, though, that, again, these new relationships with the Arab countries could have an impact, could have an impact on, 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 on who's going to succeed. Uh, because because these are you know these are influential countries, they have money, they have say, um, and they could they could tip the balance. But again, it's 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 it no there's no unfortunately mm -hmm. Abbas has not have anybody to succeed him. So we really don't know where. It's going. That Thanks. Okay, is there anyone? I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask or one they want to put in the chat? Uh, Billavine, did you yes. want to ask a question? Thank what? you. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if that's your name. That's what I see, though. <laughs> How do you see the future? Um, as a Jewish and a democratic state? Is a Jewish anti-democratic state? Oh, and, and a, oh. oh. Uh, I was gonna say, that's, that's quite a question. <laughs> <laughs> that would stump me. Um, look, uh, how do I, Israel, believe me, uh, Israel, even more than John Kerry, wants to remain a Jewish and democratic state. Uh, and it won't do anything that will that will that will make that impossible. 
which is why, to a certain degree, it's not annexing the annexing the West Bank because it doesn't want to it doesn't want to uh, annex annex all the Palestinians, and it would like to come to some kind of agreement uh, there, where they would have form of citizenship in their own state, or there's even you know, renewed talk of some kind of federation or confederation with Jordan. Uh, Israel, Israel wants to remain a Jewish democratic state. Um, the, the demographic time bomb, you know, th there's a lot of criticism of uh, Sharon for withdrawing from Gaza in 2005. One thing that it did do though, is it, it pushed back in time uh, for a number of years, the, the period when we're gonna have parity between yeah, Jews and Arabs between the Jordan River and the, and the Mediterranean Sea, right? Because you have uh, 2 million Gazans. I mean, they're, they're no longer part of the equation. Um, look, the hope is, that's why, that's why, again, that's why Israel has it annexed. The hope is that you can come, you can come to some kind of accommodation uh, with the Palestinians in the West Bank uh, so that they will not, you know, they, they will, they will, either there will be a, a truncated uh, Palestinian state uh, or demilitarized Palestinian state, or some kind of some kind of arrangement with Jordan, so that Israel does retain its Jewish democratic uh, character. Again, I think the country is cognizant of it, as cognizant as anybody any of its critics are in America, and it won't allow a situation where it will cease to be a Jewish democratic state. The exact parameters of how that's going to happen depends a lot, you know, on, on, on what happens in the region on the successor to, to, to Abu Mazen, uh, and we're gonna have to wait and see. Lisa. Herb, thanks as always for informative talk. Just a quick question about Lebanon. We, you know, we read about maritime uh, talks and agreements. Is there a movement with uh, a good way about Israel and Lebanon right now or? Really, not much going on. No, not much going on because Lebanon is very much in the pocket of Hezbollah, right? And Hezbollah has no interest in the world in any kind of accommodation with Israel. The only reason they're allowing these maritime talks to take place is because the uh, the economic situation in Lebanon is extremely dire, right? Uh, so they need they need these arrangements, these maritime arrangements, to figure out you know where they can drill for for, for natural gas to give them some kind of revenue. Uh, so it's, uh, it has nothing to do with any kind of accommodation with Israel. Hezbollah, as long as Hezbollah is in the government and they, they are in control of the arms there, right? Uh, you're not going to see much of a change with Lebanon. I would not read into the maritime talks. This isn't the agreements we're having with the UAE, with Bahrain, and with other countries, right? This is something different. This has to do purely with Lebanese uh, financial interests at a time where the country is going through extreme, extreme difficulty, they need revenue. Any other questions? Going once. Now, Gail, did you want to um, close out the program? Well, I'm happy to, or you, you can also, but I want to just thank you very much, Herb, for agreeing to speak with us and um, talk about some very interesting things in a world that's changing every time you turn around. And um, I don't know, it's great. I'm hoping